This is Nate Boyer, and you're listening to Chasing Birdies. Tweet, tweet. What is up, people? Welcome to this week's episode of Chasing Birdies, my man JP. What's shaking? Buddy, I'm just loving life right now. You know, it's been a great couple of weeks. You and I had some things going on. We, we got to see... The man Ricky Fowler get it done this past weekend over here in Detroit. So what's up with the weather? The How's the smoke situation going on in that East Coast, bud? I'm out in the West, so I don't know what's going on right now. The air quality has improved, and uh, people are starting to get back to their regular lives going outside. So that's great to see. In reality, I think everyone kept it rolling. Was it like COVID Part Two they're trying to do with us here? I mean, come on, Canada, be better, be better, Canada. <laughs> I mean, um, I didn't. I didn't know Canadians were that hot, but damn, they starting wildfires hey. left and right. Hey, um, so you're in Vail, Colorado, correct? And I'm in Elizabeth, Pennsylvania. So yeah. uh, we're doing the intro outro over the little computer screen. Yeah, but that's yeah. the closest you ever become to a buck, right there, right behind you. I mean, yeah, I think it's a oh, nose, but almost hit it in the nose. nose. Yeah, boom, boom. Um, but Ricky Fowler. So stoked for the guy, man. Mm. Mm. He's been getting questions and questions. The U.S. Open happens. He loses. Um, he's been in contention a lot. And he finally gets it done in the Dirty D. Big Dick Rick gets well, it done. Dude, I was watching, so I knew he was like kind of up there at the top. And um, so Sunday rolls around. I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to watch this in the afternoon. It's going to come on at like 1 o'clock my time or 12 o'clock. And IP texts me at 10 a.m., which is noon, your time. And he's like, Ricky's in the playoff. And I'm all, what the hell time did these guys tee off today? Like, it was 10 o'clock. It was 12 o'clock East Coast time, and he's already in a playoff. So I totally missed it. I totally missed it, man. But uh, I couldn't be happier for the guy. I love Ricky. I've said it before. And he's been long overdue for the dub. Long overdue. The media was all over him all week. I mean, think about that, dude. Have it. You're trying to get a win again, and every day, well, are you going to win? you going to win? Like dummies. Let the guy play. Yeah. I get it. I mean, but we've never had to have that problem before, and probably never will, uh, which back to Pikewood. You know, last time we talked to y'all, we were heading up to the Pikewood member guest, and um, got not a lot to report back to you. Nothing exciting other than there was a lot of um, ham, no egg, Right? Yeah, we, we didn't ham and egg. Uh, yeah. There's mm. a lot of ham, no egg. Uh, I felt like you played a nine holes good. Yeah. I would play okay. I would play a nine holes good. You'd play okay. You know, just never got on the same page, but never. we had a blast as always. I mean, we had a fun time. The new 18th green at Pikewood National is sick. Once it gets yeah. healed up, that thing's going to be scary, man. You might not be uh, able to keep it on the green. It's, it's so, it's so good. It's so good. I mean, and the putting contest, by the way, people, well, you know, you roll around, you put 20 bucks in, you get to play the putting contest. And, um, and Jonathan and I just, we just couldn't get enough of it on that Friday afternoon. What did we shoot? We shot even par? We shot even par. 18. Yes. And um, I think we each put 120 bucks in. And so we put 240 in, and I think the pot ended up being around 900. So my last two member guests, I won a par three contest and a putting contest, um, but no Excellent. flight or member guest. So, no. I mean, I guess the consolation of something, winning something, right? Like that's the world we live in. Uh -huh. um, so Jim Howard and team put on a dynamite show at Pike Wood. So thank you all for that one. Uh, the course is mint. Uh, with all the rain it had, it was still dynamite. And um, yeah, man, I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm going to see you next year there. I don't know. I'm, I'll wait for that one. Yeah, we'll, we'll play that by ear, bud. But um, yeah, we'll see. Uh, today's episode, guys, is a great episode, especially because this past Tuesday was Independence Day, July 4th. Hope you guys had a safe and happy holiday. Uh, no no one got their hands blown off by fireworks or, you know, on the golf course, whatever. Nate Boyer is a guy that I can't even explain the fact that he has done all that he's done at the young age of 42. 
I mean, you talk about a guy that goes and walks on the University of Texas football team at age 34 after serving 29, 29 whatever. At that point, 29, 34, what's the <laughs> difference? 10 years in the military total, Green Beret. Incredible story. And at the end of the day, he is chasing birdies in life. He's got this movie coming out. Movies, really. Mm-hmm. It's an awesome interview, man. Like, it's just kind of like... It really puts things in perspective. Like when you think about someone doing things compared to like us, well, it right. really makes us, it makes, it makes us look bad a little bit, but it was awesome. Well, but you can, you can get that sense from Nate and he will never say it, but it's almost like no matter what he does, he ends up being good at it. And right. it's not because he's natural. It's because he puts a lot of hard work into it. My man never played a snap of football until the age of 29 and walked on the university of Texas football team. Started at 30 to 33, off the NFL, and and we talk a lot about everything in his life, including, wait till you guys all hear the story about Colin Kaepernick. It's not what you think. It's not what you think, man. So let's go ahead and take this right over here to Nate Boyer. You guys enjoy this episode here on Jason Birdies. All right, guys. Welcome back here to another episode of Jason Birdies. And we are excited about this one today, my man. We got Nate Boyer joining us here on Chase and Birdies podcast. He has Chase Birdies in life, movies, actor, in the army, playing football, NFL, college. My man, like, what don't you do? (laughs) Diapers. Not yet. (laughs) No kids. (laughs) No kids. No No kids. kids. No kids. I know of. Happy Father's Day. Oh, shit. (laughs) Belated. (laughs) <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us today, man. This is going to be good. Of course. No, nah, good to be here. Uh, so real quick, before we get into anything, it looks like you got some sun in the background. Where are you right now? Are you in California? Are I'm actually in, I'm in Austin. I'm in Austin. It's like, it's hot, Tea. man. I'm not sure when this is Aaron, but this week, the week of, what are we, mid, mid-end of June, it's going to yeah. be over Summer 100 solstice. for like the next God knows how long, so. It's rough. Our good buddy, uh, I, I don't know if you know, him, our good buddy, George Burge. You know that name? George Burns? Speaking of Stokies. Burge. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I don't think I do. I don't think I know George. So George Burge played golf at the University of Texas. He's okay. a country singer. So he's oh, from no Austin, way. Texas. Yeah. He, I should know. He's, that's my yeah, bad. That's, yeah, that's all right. That's well, you might have one out. I've met, I know, I know. So I went to college with my senior year with Jordan Spieth's freshman year. And I think... Or maybe his, maybe my junior year was because I feel like Bo Hostler was here uh-huh. for right, right at the right when I was leaving UT. I think Bo got here, and and then well, Scheffler's a Scheffler was after me at, after that. I think yeah. I'm not exactly sure. He might have been on the team at the same time too. I actually don't know. I don't remember Scotty though, but I remember seeing I Bo think, and Jordan in like the dining hall. Yeah, yeah, just two hey, geeks. Bash, you saw him in the, in the gym, bud. I did, I did, I did. Um, so you, because I was, you know, doing my research on you, and did you go to college later in life? Yeah. Or wh- yeah what's yeah, up yeah. with that? Okay. Yeah, so I did it. I did it after the military. Yep. That's what it was. Yeah, you spent six or seven years uh, in the service. Thank you for your service. Um, Thank you. So how did that come about? I mean, I know you grew up in San Diego area. Uh, the Bay. Uh, I, I went to San Diego after high school, though. You're okay. Tracking. I got you. So I, yeah, I was born born in Tennessee, uh, in right. Oak, Oak Ridge, which is right by Knoxville. So the other mm-hmm. UT. Mm-hmm. And when I was like two, we moved to the Bay. My dad was a racehorse veterinarian. And my mom was an engineer. So he got his veterinary degree at University of Tennessee, finished up. They moved out to California. So I grew up in the Bay. And then when I graduated from high school, I moved to San Diego and I worked on a fishing boat for a little while and kind of did some odd jobs. Uh, growing up, I mean, I was a huge, I still am. I'm a huge sports fan. I'm a fan before anything else. I'm, I'm like an okay yep. athlete that just works hard, but I'm just like, a, I'm a dreamer yeah. and a big fan, you know, of, of most sports. Uh, and football was always my favorite growing up, but I didn't play. I played, uh, played soccer first, then I played little league and then I, uh, I played basketball. Um, and I, I mean, I played golf recreationally, not really competitively. And, but I, I didn't play football and I regretted it because it was my favorite sport. So I graduated high school, went down to San Diego, you know, kind of went to college for a little bit and then just dropped out, went to a junior college down there. And it wasn't really the right time for me and um, ended up working on that fishing boat. And then 
moved up to LA at 19, interested in the film and TV stuff at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and the next year is when 9-11 happened. So that's when things really started to change, not just for, I mean, the country, of course, um, but for me and my mindset and kind of what I was, you know, what I was going to end up doing with my life. I, I still didn't join the military for three more years, but it got me sort of thinking about it. And I ended up uh, eventually doing some relief work and then coming back and, and decided to be a Green Beret. It, not just any military. I mean, you're a Green Beret. Right. Um, what does Green Beret mean to you as, a, as, a, as, a, as an individual? Well, I'll tell you what it meant to me before I joined the military, because <laughs> I didn't really know. I just knew Rambo was a Green Beret, and so was John <laughs> Wayne in the movie The Green Berets. And so, like, my vision of it and what it actually is was very different, you know. When you think of Rambo, it's like, you know, bullets strapped through his right. freaking chest and, you know, rarely a shirt on, uh, tying the freaking bandana and just throwing lead down range uh, constantly. And not that that's not a part of the job, but it's not most of the job. So when, when I, uh, when I came back from Africa, I, I had done, I was in the Darfur for like two months and I did some relief work out there. And those people were just like incredible. Cause it was a war torn country. Most of the men were killed or off fighting. It's women and children in these refugee camps. They don't have anything, but they're super generous. Um, and very like just appreciative of everything. It's because of, you know, their perspective and lack of resources and what they, you know, what they didn't have really. And I just was like, man, I want to fight for people like that. And when I found out that the special forces, which that's what it's actually technically called the army special forces, the green berets, a slang term. Cause we wear a green beret. Um, when I found out that part of their mission, uh, sort of had a, uh, a humanitarian element to it. Like we're doing foreign internal defense. So if we're going to Iraq or Afghanistan, we're not only going after high value targets, we're also like, training uh and fighting alongside and sometimes even like living with you know iraqi and, and afghan civilians. special special forces and oh, they're forces. they're not civilians but they're military out there but they're like you. it just it's not the same obviously they don't have they don't have the education right. like we have they don't have the money the resources and so you do what you can and you try to get them to a level you know the goal was to get them to a level to be able to defend themselves and then obviously we did not achieve that um, <laughs> by the time we left, but it's a complicated situation. Yeah. But that's got to give you a sense of purpose because For sure. not that you didn't have one before, but clearly it sounded like you were just kind of figuring out what you were going to do. This whole thing happens, nine eleven. next thing you know, you're going in this direction. So, you know, for you, what was that purpose that you felt that it might've instilled in you? Because I think a lot of us in life, we go through life looking for a purpose and sometimes never finding it, or in, in your case, maybe finding it, and it helps facilitate other opportunities outside of that in your life. Yeah. I mean, the reason I joined is because I felt like I didn't have one. I didn't have a purpose. I felt yeah. like I didn't really belong and nothing I really did mattered to anybody. And if I wasn't, you know, honestly, if I wasn't around, like the world would be just fine without me. And that's not a good feeling to have. It's not a good place to be. No. Um, and you know, I, I, fortunately, I was, I've was i always been blessed with the type of, I guess, mentality that when things aren't going great, I'm going to do something dramatic to change the situation I'm in. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And sometimes yeah. that means joining the army. Sometimes that means, you know, going to, you know, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to just try and play football. Like, why not? Um, not a lot of people have that. I know I'm very fortunate to have that in, inside me because a lot of people, they just will they hit that, they'll get stuck in that cycle, you know, where they feel like they're hopeless and they're not, you know, nothing they do matters. They don't have a tribe and nobody wants them and there's nothing that they can do. And they start playing the blame game and, you know, it turns into this like self-fulfilling prophecy of, um, I'm not worthy of anything because mm -hmm. you genuinely believe that and you, and you, and you don't take any actions to disrupt that. So it's just going to, it's like, I mean, you can relate so many things to life, uh, to, from life to golf. <laughs> and it's like, you go, you know, the person that goes up at the tee box and every time they get up there, there's, there's gripping that thing and swinging that thing as hard as they can. And maybe they know the swing thoughts they're supposed to have, but they don't execute, they don't even try them. They're just like, 
they're like, okay, I'm gonna do this, do that, do that. Yeah. And you go up there and they don't do any of that. And you're like, well, None. I mean, it's going sideways again. You know, surprise, well, they always surprise. say over, overthinking screws you up, man. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's funny though. You said that because people, people do not just in golf, but in life, you get trapped in these mindsets that you're, you're not good enough or you, you're not worthy of this, or you start blaming other people. You feel sorry for yourself. And it's like, man, at the end of the day, you as an individual have the ability to change the environment that you're in. It just takes a little bit of effort. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with everything you guys are saying, but a lot of it is the world we're in now, social media causes a lot of this for people. I mean, you look at these teenagers that are looking at Instagram and they're in, in their mind, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. I don't look pretty enough for, I don't have enough money or things like that. So I think right. the social media side of things is really affecting people on that with yeah. what you're saying. I, 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 all, I do agree with that. Here's the thing though, to me, that's, that's frustrating. It's like people, talk about that, you know, complain about, about, well, I, you know, I, I'm not happy because I see all these things, but they continue to watch them and we continue to put them out and we continue to give them the most, uh, props, I guess. Like back in the day, there's a comedian that I don't know who the comedian is, a comedian talking about it. Like he was, I think he was an older, he was older, or he was talking about somebody else that was older. And he was like, you know, back in the day, the biggest celebrities were like astronauts. <laughs> and now it's like, <laughs> A Kardashian, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. that's a problem. And we've created that. That's yeah, a, we've yeah, we created, created that. that. And so now it's like these kids, and not just kids, yep. people, all people, adults do it too. They're like obsessed with that. Is what is what that is what the most important person in the world is? And it's like whoa, <laughs> that's yeah. so backwards. You know what backwards. I mean? Backwards. I mean, it should Jeez. be to me. It should be most accomplished people, not just I'm accomplished because of the world I was born into, and I have money, and I bought this body and all these things. It's like, yeah, no, I accomplished these things, whether you're an athlete, whether you're an astronaut, whether you're a freaking dog, I don't know, whatever. It's like, yeah. the, the, that's, that's excellence. That's incredible. Like that's, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just not the, 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 the tables have turned way too much. <laughs> and yeah. so now it's like, we're in a society where, you know, we get into the participation trophies and the like all this stuff, where you're just is, you're you're creating a bigger and bigger problem because well, you know mediocrity yeah, I mean, is considered good and fine and great and yeah. you know you're okay well, you you're look okay, at you're yourself okay. look at yourself you, you we barely started talking and I can already tell everything in your life you've earned uh, I, and, and I might be going out on a limb here but I'm willing to gamble you walked on at the University of Texas football oh, yeah. right. <laughs> I never played before. Yeah, so, that was my first time yeah, playing. So, so you worked your ass off <laughs> you, and you got rewarded right. and you played and you graduated the University of Texas as a long snapper and made it to the NFL for a cup of coffee, but you made it to the yeah, NFL. Right, right. You, and back to what you're saying is <laughs> right. that everything that you've done has been hard work and you've, you've taken, you know, taken it and and ran with it and did it yourself you're not waiting for somebody else to help you or whatever it may be um because a walk on at university of texas i mean that's like top 10 football schools in the country yeah, right I, walk on like you never played a snap of ball in your life and you walk on no and, and you know what i mean i i credit a lot of that to obviously my time in the military and the people I served with because they pushed me and, and I did work very hard. You're not wrong, but I put myself around people that were harder working than me, that were smarter than me, that were better than me. And it was okay to me to be the, the least in the room. You know what I mean? And that's, that's the pro I think a lot of people now, like they, that's their biggest fear. I walk into a room and I'm the stupidest person. I'm like, that's a blessing. <laughs> you're lucky. If you're walking yeah. in the room and you're the smartest person you know, and the most talented person, like you need to leave that room. <laughs> you're not going to yeah. get anything. You're right. not going to, you're not going to grow in that room, you know? Yeah. So, That's but true. no, I, 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 I did that because it was a regret I had not playing as a kid and I loved football. It was my, like I said, it was my favorite sport. And I was like, man, I'm going to Texas. It's in, I'm in Austin. It's, you know, it's a beautiful town. It's a beautiful school. It's great, but I'm a little bit older student. And I'm coming out of the military and I need, I need something else to sort of not obsess over. That's not the right word, but like a challenge to, 
you know, a, a bigger challenge, something that I'm not quite sure I can do. And, and so I started training for it and, and, you know, and, and, and tried out and, and, uh, you know, just made the scout team first. Cause I was, I was in good condition. You know, they're, they're new. I, right. I can, we'll just be able to run over this guy all day and he'll keep getting up, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so how old were you whenever you tried to walk on university of Texas football team? 29. 29. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Remember, 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 you guys went to college, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember being a, remember, you remember being like a senior and how the freshmen looked like 12 when the new freshmen got there? Imagine being, imagine being 29, (laughs) imagine being 29. Like, dude, it was crazy. I'm I'm like, I, so every year when the new, the new kids get there and I'm just like, that, that is not, that person has not hit puberty. How are they in the same class? So I have so many more questions now that you're 29. Yeah. Well, now I'm I mean, 42. <laughs> well, now, but I'm saying 29 years old, you're walking on a college football team. People are probably like, what the hell are you thinking? Yeah. But like you said, that was always a dream of yours. And you said, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to go after and try to do this. Now, my next question is, how did you end up on a long snap? <laughs> so <laughs> when I when I decided when I decided I was going to go, I was actually in Iraq when I decided I was going to go to Texas. And I had a year left on my contract. I decided not to reenlist. I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to go to school. If I don't go now, I'm never going to go. I mean, at least for me, I just was like, I was already, you know, I was 28 at that time. And, uh, I was like, I I need to make this call. So I, um, applied, I got in, uh, to school there and I was like, well, if I go, I might as well try and play football. So I was like, given my size, I'm not a big guy. I'm like five, 10 and change. And I weigh at the time, I was like 100 and maybe 170 uh, when I was in the Army. So I was like, well, I, I'm going to be like a slot receiver or, or a DB. That's the only two positions that make any sense. So I started Googling and YouTube and football videos and running routes in the sand out there on base when we had free time and trying to teach myself how to backpedal. <laughs> and then I started like – I was like – pounding calories just trying to gain weight you know lift started doing olympic lifts and all this different stuff it was it was nice because it was i mean it was a nine-month deployment the last five months of that i was focused on preparing for you know college and football so i was like i had me it was like a the routine i got in man i got i was the best shape of my life i was in crazy shape and very strong too for for how small i was and uh so but then when i got to texas even with all that preparation and training those dudes are so fast. And like, I just wasn't, dude, I was, I, I was, I ended up being a safety and I couldn't cover anybody that was like going to play on, on Saturday. Uh, I just didn't have the, I mean, first of all, I didn't have the skill and the, you know, I didn't never play before, but also just the net. Those guys are such good athletes at that level. Like you said, it's a top 10 program. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's the best of the best. Yeah. Coming out of high school, go to the University of Texas. So exactly. who was your quarterback at University of Texas when you were there? So That's about, what, I had a bunch of them. Yeah. I, unfortunately, I just missed, you know, well, Vince Vince Young was a good buddy and so was Colt McCoy were the two yeah. before me. So those guys were champions, you know. And then when we played, we had guys that were really talented. We just, the team, we had some coaching changes and mm-hmm. – we just couldn't figure out in the trenches. We were getting beat a lot. And so I had uh, David Ash, who was NFL caliber, but he had con- concussion issues. So he only, I think he probably only started 15, 20 games in his career, but he was, you know, he had a good record. And I mean, he would have been an NFL player. And then we had Case McCoy, which is Colt's younger right, yeah. brother. Mm-hmm. And Case, mm-hmm. here's the thing with Case. Like he knew, he knew, we, everybody knew, like he, he probably doesn't have the NFL arm in the NFL. I was obviously the, I mean, he's my size. He's a little taller, but he's not a big dude. And, you know, he, he just didn't have that. But Case was just a winner in his mind. And he, I mean, we beat Oklahoma. He had an incredible game in that game. He had some big wins in his career, uh, Texas A&M in, their, in the final battle in that game. But it was like, you know, he just, it, 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 he's not Vince Young and he's not even, you know, his brother Cole. And he knew that. And so, and then we had Tyrone Swoops at the very end. And Tyrone Swoops, he plays tight end in the NFL now. He tra- he, you know, moved over, but he's a big dude. He was like 6'5, 230, you know, could throw it a mile. Um, but he, when I was playing with him, he was a freshman, you know, and so he was just kind of figuring things out. And he ended up moving to uh moving to tight end when we had the 
you know, the next round of quarterbacks come through. So, so is that when Mac Brown was there? Mm-hmm. My first uh, four years, I registered in my very first year, and then my my last year uh, was. So Char- you were thirty three in your last year. Yeah, exactly. My last year was uh, Charlie Strong. Um, it's mind blowing. I, I just so, it's it's crazy yeah. to at thirty three. I'm thinking like at thirty three year. I mean, did the boys j- joke around with you a little bit? Call your grandpa or oh, yeah. pap or what? Uh, dude, grandpa, old man, Captain America is a little better. <laughs> Sergeant Slaughter, you know all those things. Uh, but yeah, my so my to answer your question, I, started, I went on a tangent there. But my red shirt freshman year, when I finally was like, all right, no matter how hard I try, I'm just I'm not going to get on. I'm never going to be a starting DB. So I got to find a way on the field, and that's when I started long snapping. I, I, you know, I was 31 when I long snapped my first ball and I just was watching the other snappers do it. And I started the same thing. I went back to YouTube and, you know, how can I learn how to do this? And started messing with it. Six months later, uh, come back from overseas. I was, I was in the national guard while I was in college. So I still deployed a few times. I came back from overseas and coach Brown, let me try out for the position in training camp. There was like 10 guys by the end of training camp. I was the backup. And after the first game, I was the starter. So, and then I started for insane. three years. Yeah, it was cool. It's fair to say, bud, that you're really good at whatever you do. No, no. I just work my ass off, man. I put That's in right. so much time, so much time. But and I tried it with golf and it didn't work. <laughs> so well, golf, not everything I do in golf is hard, man. Golf's <laughs> one of those things that like, I, I posed the question on our last episode, like, talking to a 20 handicapper what makes you a 20 handicapper like in all seriousness what is it and golf's one of those games where or sports where you could sit there and try to figure it out and you're not going to figure it out in all reality like even right. even the tour players even as good as they are they're still trying to figure something out oh dude and justin thomas had an 81 yeah. the other day like exactly on, man. he shot more exactly. rounds in the 80s in the last four weeks exactly than he has in a set. like no that's no. crazy it's, it's just it's a stupid it, game but it's so much fun <laughs> so yeah yeah it's 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 addicting but i like that i like that about you nate like hey man i'm graduating college at 33 to each their own right like do what you got to do then after college you roll up to Seattle now, so you walk onto UT. You try to be a safety a DB. You weren't fast enough. You decide to become a long snapper. You rip it up, and you become an undrafted free agent or undrafted yeah. rookie. At now what? Thirty four. Thirty four. Yeah. <laughs> to the Seattle Seahawks. Well, and at this point, you have you have already served six years on tour, correct? Yeah, well, I did, I did that on active, and then the last four, I was in the National Guard while I was in college. So ten, ten technically, if you count the National Guard time, but that doesn't actually count fully because you're, you know, you're not unless you're overseas yeah. or something. You're not, uh, you're not working every day. So then you go from that, and then now you're in the NFL. And so, what, what was that transition like, or what? Wow, like just explain that. The yeah, feeling. that was uh, so after my senior year. That was the year. Yeah, we had a, a new coach come in. You know, Mac was sort of forced to step down. It was an ugly situation. And so it was tough for Charlie Strong coming into that, our new coach, because, you know, we, we just – he was trying to change change things. And, you know, every coach that comes in, they want to change the culture and kind of make it go their way, and that makes sense. But we had – like my class of seniors was a really good team. Like we were building to – like this was going to be the year we were going to go out there and win the Big 12 and maybe contend for a national title – right out the gate, you know, he wanted to clean house with guys that were not doing the right thing. And so like six starters and a bunch of other guys were were kicked off the team. And so all of a sudden it's like, you know, the seniors are pretty, a lot of them were pretty upset because it was like, dude, you're tearing apart this team that has a chance to do something. We're all, and those guys are all trying to make it to the NFL. I mean, I had dreams of that, but I didn't genuinely think it was going to happen. So we go through the year, you know, we we were at like a 500 uh, winning. You know, we won half the games. Uh, went to the Texas Bowl, got our asses kicked by Arkansas. It was, ugly. It was probably the worst game I played in. Like we just, we had like 100 yards of offense. It was ugly. So I thought that was it. I thought that was the last game I was ever going to play in. And I ended up getting a phone call from this senior all-star game called the Medal of Honor Bowl. So the Medal of Honor Society 
uh, used to host this game in Charleston, South Carolina at the Citadel, which was really cool to be able to play at that. The Citadel is like this iconic campus out there in South Carolina. And it was one of the smaller all-star games. There's about four or five every year. There's the Reese's Senior Bowl is the big one where like the first rounders go play. And this was a smaller one. So I go out there to play every day at practice throughout the week. There's all these scouts and NFL front office folks at practice. I didn't know that was like a thing. And I mean, there's like a hundred of them at some of these practices. And so they also want to meet with some of these players because most of the guys I was out there with were, you know, anywhere from the third round to undrafted caliber dudes. And I ended up having meetings with like four or five teams that they, they were like, Hey, we want to meet with you. And I was like, why? <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like, like I'm what? tiny and I'm old, but okay. Uh, so we met and they were like, Hey, look, long snapping is one of those unique positions. You know, you might have a shot at this, even at your age, you're going to have to put some weight on. Um, but you know, we'll see what happens. And at the time I probably weighed about 195 pounds and, uh, I obviously wasn't any taller. So uh, I just said, all right, well, I'm just going to go for it. So over the next four months before the draft, I put on like 30 pounds. Uh, I got up to 225, <laughs> which eating, was crazy. Oh, taking my God, creatine? Dude. I was doing everything except for sticking a needle in my arm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, And I was about to that point. I was like, well, what are the odds? We'll find out. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I, I, I ate. I had to be eating like 7,000 calories a day. Like I had to oh be, my God. I mean, I Chicken was trying to, eggs. I was trying to guess dude, everything and and trying to stay relatively healthy with it. Yeah. But I'd have two like 32 ounce shakes that just had protein, like a whole avocado, uh, banana, um, you know, BCAAs and creatine yeah. and whatever. And I was just like smashing this thing. I do two of those a day and then I would have like five meals, you know, and and your farts probably smelled oh like oh my god eggs. dude i was terrible sorry like yeah i know no, it's just the reality man it is um, anyways yeah i got a pretty I, speaking of that i was thinking about that last night i got a pretty clean, clean system these days you know i haven't yeah. been i haven't been in that place in a long time but it's a scary place yeah, to be you know what i mean yeah you never know <laughs> you never know you're gonna buzz out <laughs> so uh, i <laughs> including yourself um yeah. but i sure. uh yeah so i i put all that weight on May 2nd, 2015 is the last day of the draft. It's also the Kentucky Derby, Pacquiao Mayweather, Game 7s in the NBA and uh, uh, NHL playoffs. It was supposed to be like – they called it like the biggest day in sports history. Like That probably happens every year. There's probably some day they call that. But that was a pretty big day. Um, and after the – you know, I didn't think I was going to get drafted. But I actually had – the Cardinals had talked to me and said, hey, we have the last pick in the draft, Mr. Irrelevant. You're on the list maybe – they ended up not picking me, so I was a little bummed. Um, but then the phone rang shortly after, and I got two calls from the from the Rams, who were in St. Louis at the time, and from the Seahawks, who had been to back-to-back -back Super Bowls and were kind of the it team at the time. So I just, you know, I, I, I took about 30 minutes to think about it. I had to pick one. I, you know, I called my dad. I called my agent. I called friends of mine, other long snappers. And pretty much it was almost unanimous. There was maybe one person that thought St. Louis made more sense because I'd have a better chance of starting there or, or winning the job because they only keep one, they only keep one long snapper per team, you know, after training camp preseason. So, but I was like, you know what, all things being equal, I got to do Seattle. Like it's just, they, this, I mean, it was Marshawn Lynch and Richard Sherman and Russell Wilson and Doug Baldwin, Bobby Wagner, Jimmy Graham, Cam Chancellor, it was a squad, you know what I mean? It just made sense. And so I went to Seattle and um, was fortunate to not get cut until uh, week two of the preseason, but you know, eventually my number got called. Well, the funny thing about Seattle now is Geno Smith, West Virginia grad, yeah. which is where I am in Morgantown. He's like a late bloomer now. Yeah. Right? Like oh, dude, he, gets, awesome. he has this, he has that amazing year last year and then he gets this great contract so deserving of it good for him but it's kind of funny because i feel like i don't know I'm, I'm my dates are a little bit off right now but i feel like when you were at texas we played against each other he yeah beat for us. sure he beat us in that we had an, an epic game in austin and that's the game where he flipped off the cameras i don't know if you remember that or flipped off the fans yeah. 
and the yeah. cameras caught it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we It was 48-45. Yeah. I was the long snapper that game. Uh, they beat us 48-45. It was back and forth. It was a hell of a game, man. It was, it was one of the coolest atmospheres I played in in Austin because there was just so much, like, there was a lot of scoring, but there was also just a lot of anger and hate. Anger, yeah. <laughs> Well, they say that UT, I mean, some of the games at UT are just some of the best in football. Dude, the um, Bama, so the, the Bama game this last year, we played Bama at home. Our starting quarterback got knocked out in the first quarter. Remember that? And he had 150 yards passing already. Um, we ended up losing, I think, 19 to 17 or something. But when yeah. our defense played great. We were in, we should have won the game. But the the Bama players, multiple guys after the game in the press conference said that's the craziest environment I ever played in, and all the SEC yeah. fans are like, you know, the SEC, it's the most arrogant yeah. conference yeah. ever. We're about to there go play go. them every every year yeah. next year. Yeah, I was gonna say you're leaving, um, and I, I I'm excited. I want I can't wait to go to the SEC. But like, you know, they were like, no way, no way. And I'm like, talk to your damn players, man. Like the place the place is crazy, you know, crazy. So. Uh. I, I I'd be lying to you. I I searched. I did a little search to do some re- research on you um, before our interview, and I type your name into Google, and up comes a photo of Colin Kaepernick kneeling next to you on the sideline. What what went through your mind as a Green Beret? And and I'm not saying right, wrong, or indifferent. I'm just saying what went through Nate's mind. There was a Green Beret fought for this country, and Colin's taking a stance for what he believes in. Well, there's a little more to that story, like where that picture came from, because the two weeks prior to that, during the preseason games, uh, he'd been sitting on the bench, right, uh, during the anthem. And it caught national news. And also, this is, keep in mind, this is, this is September 2016. Uh, so it's, uh, two months before Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton, like the most divisive election ever, pretty much. Yeah. You know, and it was already a very divisive time. It still is, you know, but it, it just felt like it was kind of getting to this point. And so when Colin took a knee, both, you know, every, or excuse me, when he started sitting, every mainstream news outlet and social media just went on fire, you know, whether you were with him or against him, it just became like, you know, are you team Colin or team America? I don't know. (laughs) And, uh, so I had a lot of people reach out to me. This is the year after I was in Seattle. Um, so there still was like to a lot of people, it was like, Oh yeah, that's that, you know, that green beret that played football. So real Um, quick, are you playing for San Fran or are you working with the team? Not neither. Neither. Okay. So, um, I grew up in the Bay, so I'm a huge Niner fan. That's my favorite team. Um, so what, what ended up happening was, uh, I had a lot of people reach out to me. Um, and I had also had CNN and Fox news and MSNBC. They all reached out to me too. Like, Hey, come on our show and weigh in on this, you know, come debate. And I'm like, I don't, that, that's not going to help anything. I don't want to do that. Uh, there's no win there. Um, and then I had, uh, yeah, like close friends, people I serve with, um, other people just, they said, how are, why are you so silent about this? And I'm like, I don't, I mean, it's not my fight. Like, it's not my, I, I don't know. Like, why do I have to say something? Um, so it's like you said, like what the reason he was doing it was not, it wasn't anti-America. It was just, uh, you know, he, he felt like law enforcement was not being held accountable when these things happen, you know, and take aside all the stats and all that stuff. Like it should never happen. You know, one is too many when something like that happens, it's just like suicide. Like it's zero is the only acceptable number, right? Um, not that it's not complicated, but it's just the reality. And and all the cops that I know, when they see something like this happen, they're just like, God damn, dude, come on. Like you're killing me. I mean, it, you know, you're bringing, you're, 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 you're making it a lot harder for me to do my job and mm-hmm. to wear this uniform and this badge with pride when that happens. Cause you know, we get grouped in, into being with you, you know, we get uh, sort of discriminated against because of the uniform we wear now. And I know people on the other side of the situation felt that, you know, people of color felt that for a long time and, and feel that still. Um, and a lot of that for, in my opinion, for, you know, for good reason, like we do not have a perfect history. So it's just like, it's a very complicated issue. And um, uh, what I ended up doing was uh, I finally wrote 
an open letter through the Army Times, which not that many people read, but the Army Times, I, I knew they would let me write whatever I wanted to write. And I wouldn't have to, so I was just, I wouldn't have to debate anybody on it. So I was like, all right, well, I'll do that. And then if people keep hitting me up, it'd be like, I did something, you know, I wrote this, this is, I wrote this open letter. And so I wrote it, addressed it to Colin and just said, Hey man, like I got a lot of respect for you. You were, you were, you know, you're a 49er. And when you came to the team, I've been pulling for you since you got there. But I just want, you know, I want you to understand like for me and a lot of people like those symbols or they mean something a little bit different. You know, I've, I've carried a casket draped in an American flag with my best friend's body in it. And so, you know, things just are, thing, thing, it's, it's all a matter of perspective and experience and we've got different ones, you know, but at the end of the day, like I also fought for your right to do exactly what you're doing, you know, the first amendment, you know, we took the oath to defend the constitution. We don't always have to like or agree with everything that people exercise, but we should respect it. You know, if it's done in a, uh, nonviolent manner, which is what he was right. doing. So I respected that. And a lot of people disagreed and that's totally fine. You know what I mean? But by and large, I think most people uh, appreciated the letter because it was kind of like, Hey, this is where I come from. This is how I feel, but it's all good. Like, you know, I, I, I hope that you are inspired to stand again one day because that would mean a lot to me. And that's kind of how I ended the letter and Colin ended up reading it. Um, somehow it got to him and he reached out to me and said he wanted to meet. So the day of that, that the picture was taken, I, I went down to San Diego. They were playing the Chargers in their final preseason game. And I met with Colin for a couple of hours before the game. I sat down with him and Eric Reed, who was another player for the Niners um, that went on and played several seasons after in the NFL. And we just talked about, you know, our backgrounds, our lives, our experiences and Everybody in the conversation had a lot of respect for one another. And, uh, you know, at, at the end of it, Colin sort of asked me, do you think there's another way I can protest or demonstrate that's not going to offend people in the military? And I was like, mm, I don't know. Like, you know, it's, that's a tough one. Like, no matter what, people are going to be, I think some people are going to be offended. But, I, you know, I do think if you're willing to be alongside your teammates at a minimum, that would go a long way. I think sitting back on the bench on your own by yourself maybe rub some people wrong. And, and, uh, so he said, uh, well, I've committed to not standing, so I can't do that. And I just, I suggested that he take a knee then, uh, alongside his team. And he thought it was more powerful actually, and a better idea. And, and I thought, well, at least it shows he's compromising in some way or, g- or given a little bit, but, right. but you know, most people, <laughs> once that happened, it didn't matter. I mean, people said there was booing in the stadium when, when it was going on, I was sitting there like, Oh man, my bad. <laughs> so did he ask you to stand next to him? Uh, we had actually discussed initially, it was all, everything happened super fast in this conversation. Like it was like, this was two hours before kickoff and we're talking. And so I, I, when I said that, when I said, Hey, if you're willing to, you know, to take a knee, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be with you. And, uh, you know, I, I, and I'll stand with you on that. And, and I, I I honestly, I'll be straight up, man. I considered, I was like, if he's willing to do this, man, maybe I should do it with him. You know, maybe that'll quiet people down. And so I considered that. And then I thought about that and I was like, you know what, man, like, Mm -hmm. I'm just going to get crucified. I'm just, I'm going to get crucified, but like, I don't really want to, you know, I kind of, I still want to stand, but I'm willing to stand next to this person. So I told him, you know, I think we'd already parted ways and I shot him a text. I was like, Hey man, like, I'll stand next to you if that's cool. You know, I, I respect what and he was like, yeah, man, for sure. So I, at that point, that's when I talked to, I talked to, uh, oh God, what's his, what's his, I can't think of his name right now. The coach, uh, he was with the Ducks before um, the Niners. He was with the Eagles too. Oh, oh uh, Chip Kelly. Chip, Chip Kelly, Kelly, thank you. God, that was bad. I was thinking Chad. So Chip was the coach at the time. So I talked to Chip and he said, yeah. Let's just get with the GM and the um, and the president and see if they're cool with that. And so I talked to them and they were like, "Yeah, you're good to go. Like, you know, be on the sideline with us." And and so that's what that's where that picture that's why that picture was taken. Wow. So we had a we had good Bash. Story. I don't know if you remember this, but you remember Villanueva, 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 oh, yeah. Villanueva. Oh, Ollie. Yeah. yeah, I love Ollie. He almost did the opposite. 
mm. right? The Steelers were not going to come out for for the national yeah, anthem. Right, right. They were taking a stance, and then he got crucified for coming out and putting his hand over his heart. Exactly. Yeah, he was so, the same kind of thing. He was like, I can't. My guys are. I think he, he might have had dudes texting him in the locker room, like, "You better be out there." You know what I mean? And he's and, just and, like, and so ah, it's like a moral dilemma. Back to what you, but back what you said. You said, no matter what you do, it doesn't matter if it's right, wrong, or indifferent. Right. Nowadays, you get crucified. Yeah, that's true. By someone. Somebody. It does not matter. Well, it's yeah, also, it it's also matter. social media again. No. You know? And and <laughs> and that, I can understand both perspectives i mean i understand why people get upset at that at that action of kneeling 100 percent. i mean it's our country you know we have freedoms that other countries don't have and we have people protecting us day in and day out to have those freedoms uh but there is that segment of it where people are wrongfully targeted and some people aren't going to stand for that so they're not going to overlook the fact that that person was wrong they're going to hold them accountable for those wrongdoings. And I get that too. Uh, but it, in today's world, you you have to walk this line of almost being perfect and and not having any any type opinion. of <laughs> opinion. I mean, it's like Bob Huggins, West Virginia's basketball coach. I mean, he's a legend here in West Virginia. And granted, he messed up six w- weeks ago on air. Certainly, and and they handled that accordingly. What, what ha- I don't even know what happened. Well, he used a, a slur that was not acceptable, and he shouldn't have gotcha. said it. And he said it, but he got suspended a couple games, lost a little bit of money. No big deal. Was still going to coach, and then he gets arrested for a DUI this past oh, weekend or two weeks ago in Pittsburgh. And and I'm like, look, that could happen to anyone. Just because he's somewhat in the public eye. I don't necessarily know if he needs to lose his job over it. Like it wasn't, it's not a major crime. Well, he a, and, he, and even if he does, he shouldn't lose his legacy. I mean, if you look at, you know, no. I'm, a big, I'm a big Kobe Kobe Bryant fan, but Kobe was not perfect. You know what I mean? Kobe no. made mistakes. And there's, there's quite a history on a lot of people, um, athletes or not, that, you know, did, did something, um, made mistakes because yeah. we all make mistakes, right? And it's just like you got to look at the whole person, like their character overall. And right? Like, are they regretful? Are they all, all these things? Which I'm sure Coach Huggins is. Like I don't, you know, I don't know, but I imagine he wishes he wouldn't have got behind the wheel and wishes that the word wouldn't have slipped out of his mouth or whatever. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's just like the, you you it's, can't it's, you can't win in society today. Like you, no, you can't. No matter what, like one of the nicest people. Um, I've met in the Hollywood sphere is Chris Pratt, right? Everybody, he loves everybody. He treats everybody the same. That dude gets targeted because he goes to church. Day day. You know what I mean? And it's just like, yeah. dude, you cannot win. You cannot win. No. You can't. You just can't. You can't. So, no, you That's can't. I play golf for fun. Uh, but you, I don't know, and you still can't win. You also can't Listen, win we that. Can all, <laughs> we, That's an unwinnable can, game, dude. Right, I don't get it. He's a Not you. I'm saying everybody, everybody. Everybody. Unless you're on the tour, you, you ain't winning. <laughs> Even when you are, you shoot an 81 sometimes. Yeah. So let's talk about that. You know, that's a really cool story with Kaepernick. I mean, it, it took some balls on your end, uh, so that's commendable. But I, I think that's a great story. At least people now can hear the story behind that picture. Um, yeah. And speaking of pictures, we're talking motion pictures right now, Mr. Boyer, because it is my understanding that you had been kind of involved in the in the film world for some years. Obviously, you mentioned earlier you moved to Hollywood. Um, but right now, you know, at the young age of 41, you're cracking into this thing a little, 42, my bad, cracking into this thing a little heavier now. So tell us and the listeners uh, you know, I know you had a, a a film coming out, MVP, or it might have came out. Yep. Um, but more about what you're doing right now in Hollywood, in 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 the movie sphere. Uh, yeah. So that we could. I you know I I always I told you when I was 19 I moved up to to LA from San Diego and I was mm-hmm. I was interested in film and TV at the time, but I didn't really know where to start. I mean, I took some acting classes, didn't really like actors for the most part la is a tough city man like it's 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 uh it's definitely a love hate when you're up there when you're out there it's like you got the beach and incredible weather and 
beautiful people and great restaurants and all that. But then there's insane traffic. There's a lot of mm-hmm. fake stuff and it's a grind and it's expensive. Mm-hmm. So there's like, there's that too. So uh, that was tough. And, and growing up in my, you know, my early twenties, not being in college, all my friends are graduating college and they're meeting, you know, their future spouse and like all these things are happening. And I'm just like, I feel like I'm going nowhere and I'm just, you know, partying way too much and mm-hmm. never like not really doing what I wanted, you know, what I want to do. And, and then was fortunate to have that opportunity in the military because it really shifted everything for me. So now after football's over, circle back, I'm, you know, 35 now and I'm back out in LA and I'm back. I had a year left on my GI bill because my, my, uh, when I won this long snapping job, I got put on scholarship. So I saved my GI bill from the military. And I still had a year left and I, took it, I use it to take some film classes down in LA. And so I was doing that. I had a good agent um, that I'd met through uh, Jay Glazer, um, who I ended up co-founding the MVP charity with and started getting out auditioning a little bit and got a couple jobs kind of quick. I, I, I was in this uh, video game called Madden. You ever heard of it? Uh, they had a, <laughs> you ever heard of it? <laughs> they had a story, they had a story mode in 2000. It came out in eight, 2018, but it was the one with Tom Brady on the cover. It's called the goat edition. And you could do this. You could play this story inside of it where you were this quarterback that went to Texas. And in the story, his father passed away. His, his father was played by Mahershala Ali. Who's actually an Oscar winner um, from Moonlight and some other movies. Uh, Green book. Um, you've seen that dude, but this guy, his father passed away. He ends up quitting the football team, joining the military. And when he goes mm-hmm. overseas, I play like his captain and also sort of his mentor in the military. And I encourage him, hey, if your dream is to play football, you know, go to school, go back and, and do it. So he goes back, doesn't go back to school, sorry. He goes back and starts training to be in the NFL. So I sort of pass him on to Dan Marino, who becomes his quarterback coach in the video game. So my first like acting scene is with all the dots on my face and the camera, oh, like yeah. the video games, the motion capture with Dan Marino. So I was super nervous. I was like, man, what am I doing? Um, but it was, it was great. And then from there, I got to be in this movie called Den of Thieves. And I was in this movie called 12 Strong about the uh, uh, first Green Berets that went to Afghanistan after uh, – 9-11 that's like a it's chris hemsworth and michael shannon and michael pena are in that one and michael uh, pena that's pep's boy and uh, yeah he's a golfer and then uh yeah. 12 uh den of thieves was a gerard butler movie gerard butler 50 cent uh o'shea jackson jr some other folks um and then i was on this is us and i started just stacking up these little guest star roles and things but i was like man i really want to make movies though too i want to get behind the camera so Our charity, Merging Vets and Players, uh, the one I started with Jay, um, MVP for short, where we bring together combat vets and former pro athletes and help them find purpose and identity when they lose a uniform. Uh, We were starting to grow. We were having chapters pop up all over the country. And then COVID hit and we had to shut down operation for a bit. I decided to make, we decided to make a movie uh, about MVP, uh, about how it all started. So I co-wrote, ended up directing, producing, acted in, you know, I did a lot of the post-production stuff, this very low budget movie. Um, but we had Anthony, uh, Tony Gonzalez and uh, Randy Couture and Michael Strahan, Howie Long have cameos in it. Uh, Tom Arnold's in it, um, playing like a fantasy football guy. Tom Arnold's hilarious, man. Uh, um, Dan Loria, who was the dad on the Wonder Years back in the day. He's a Vietnam yeah. vet. <laughs> every, every other... Uh, veteran portrayed on screen is played by an actual vet and the story is about a marine who was living in a homeless shelter based on a true story who was living on in a homeless shelter on sunset boulevard in east hollywood with a bunch of other veterans they, they call this place the barracks and he meets an nfl player uh first year out of the league played for like 10 11 seasons was a grinder you know but just was first round pick but just never really panned out so he feels like he was a bust these dudes meet and on paper, they got nothing in common, but they're going through a lot of the same struggle of losing the identity with that uniform and the team and trying to find purpose again and um, kind of help each other through that. So that movie, we, we finished it up and then uh, uh, it was out on Amazon Prime and Apple TV. We had this theatrical run. We were in like 35 theaters for a while and then Showtime licensed it in February. So now it's, uh, you wow. can anybody can see it. You know, it's out there. Congrats on that. Wow, man. Thank you. Thank again, you. I mean, Nate boy. This guy. So, 
touches it and it's hard work but this is this is where it is it's hard work right and and the the, the fruits of your labor you could do anything if you want to and yeah, no, that's, no, that's my is. that's I mean, that's my message. If I go when I when I do when I have speaking engagements or talk to young people or old people, it doesn't matter. I'm just like, dude, you're not too old. It doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter what you study in college. Um, I think more than anything, for me at least, college was like it's a rite of passage. It's like you learn how to. You're showing people that you know how to commit to something and finish something. That's not always fun. I mean, a lot of college is fun, but. Marriage. You know, you're kind of getting through that. It's not like, oh, I studied this. I have to be this for the rest of my life. Like, no, you right. don't. You can, you can reinvent over and over and over, but you got to you got to put the work in. You got to put the time in. You got to commit to it and kind of dedicate yeah. your life to it in a sense. And it's, but anything is possible. So is Chris Pratt one of your favorites to work with or? Yeah. Yeah. He's great. He's great. I, I, I was in, the last thing I was in before MVP came out was, uh, it's called The Terminalist. So it's on Amazon Prime. Um, it's a series based on the, the Jack Carr novels, which are called The Terminalist. He's got like seven books out now. And Chris plays the lead in that. But that dude, like I said, because I've seen it firsthand and I've, I've got to know him a little bit over the years, that guy treats everybody the same. He has so much respect for the veteran community. He's got respect for, you know, just people generally. And yeah. he had a lot, he made sure on the terminal list, he made sure that uh, there were so many veterans involved in the writer's room, producing it, acting in it, like all the tech advisors, of course, like they need to be anyway, but like he just made sure it was people that he, he trusted and his good friend, uh, uh, his good friend, Jared Shaw, who was a Navy SEAL and they met on the set of uh, Zero Dark Thirty. So they've been friends for years. He was like, Jared, I trust you to help me build this team. Like, let's do this right because we have a great opportunity to make a great show, but we're not making this mm -hmm. for, for Hollywood. We're making this for, yeah. you know, for these guys, you know, yep. for the millions of vets that are out there. And if Hollywood embraces it too great, you know, which they did, the movie did, or the show did very well. They're making a prequel and a sequel. But that's be, I think it's because it's authentic. You know, it's as, it's as, it's as, it's as real as they could make it in a fictional story. It's a very fictional story, of course. But it's if this were to happen, this is how this would happen. Thing. and that's a lot of that's due to chris man that's awesome yeah i have to check that out Do dude it. it's been it's been cool just sitting here listening to you you know oftentimes it's us having to pull stuff out of people you know thinking about what we're gonna say or whatnot and you just can't get me to do. shut up you know nothing no but i like that <laughs> it makes it so much better because it's like you could just feed off of what you're saying and not have to worry about Oh, so, you know, where are you from? What you do? Uh, what you eat for breakfast? Blah, blah, blah. It kind of makes it a little easier. You guys, you so guys talk you. mostly to, mostly to, uh, to golfers normally? Robots? Is that kind of the, no. Not, not, robots? Or is it just a mix? <laughs> it's um, a mix. And, and, and we, tr we do everything with people that love the game of golf. And, uh, they're the best at what they do. You know, we've had Willie Robertson on here, Brian oh, Erlacher, love it. uh, those kind of guys, country singers. So we get a little bit of different, different from everyone yeah uh, right so this has been awesome but so tell us a little bit about your golf game so i had a good run in uh 2019 when things were kind of slow in my it was in the in the middle of my career like i had done some of the acting stuff but it was before you know i started doing stuff behind the camera um i was i was co i was hosting a, an nfl network series at the time uh, called Indivisible that was kind of like an Anthony Bourdain style show, but that was only during football season. So off season, I had a lot of time, dude, I started for the first time in my life. I took, I took some real lessons. I started practicing, you know, almost every day for a while there. I shot a 72 on a par 72. I had the game of my life, uh, almost under par, which for me is incredible. And then when COVID hit, I completely stopped playing again. So now I'm creeping back into it and I suck, but dude, it's incredible. Like I, I love the idea that when you're out there, like you put your, you kind of talked about it. You put your phone in the bag, you sort of shut off from all that stuff for a bit. You know, I like to walk if I can, you know, and I'll, oh, yeah. I'll walk out there and it's like you and that little white ball. And if you don't give your full attention to that ball on every swing, you know, it, it, it's, it's it, it goes sideways. Yeah. It goes. It's, just a, it's a great lesson for life, man. Like you got to focus when, if you really want something, you have to focus and, and then when it's over, it's over, you know, you, you after the yeah. 18th hole, maybe you shot a 72, maybe you shot 102, but like, yeah, you, you know, 
The you, beer's going to be cold regardless. Exactly. You, uh, you started the round with the blank canvas, and you finished the round with a piece of art. Whether it's good or bad, it is what it is. Yeah. On to the next one. Totally. Uh, and that's I mean, the beauty of golf. It, and, it, it, and it's ahead. just a game that you learn so much about yourself. You learn about you. You learn about the other person. You know, um, and you build relationships that open up so many doors. You know. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, I think, that's, I think that the main thing there is yeah, how much you learn about yourself. Like, yeah, 100%. I remember I, I had one round that I started out, I was three under through two holes, you know what I mean? And for me, that was like amazing. I was like, oh man. For anybody, that's amazing. This is, this is the day, you know? Yeah. And I probably shot a 47 on the back, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's just, it's crazy. And then the, the day I shot a 72, I had two sevens on the card, you know? Yeah. It was just like... Ye you don't know. Dude, they, I board, I boarded four of the last six holes coming in and some and shot even. And it was just like I was playing well. I mean, even with the seven, I was playing well for me. I mean, I, I'm not at the time I was probably a seven handicap, right? Um, so I was playing very well, but then it I was like, man, I'm only four under, there's six holes left. Wouldn't it be cool? And then all of a sudden, like everything starts going in and it's just like it happens, you know? <laughs> We've been very fortunate to play with all walks of life, you know. Yeah. Uh country singers, professional hockey players, baseball players. Hockey players and are good. Again, they are the best at what they do, right? I mean, we've played with people that have scored 40 goals in the NHL. And this freaking game, just nobody Rattles. can figure it out. Rattles. No, no. It's hard. And it's, it's crazy. I'll tell you what, though. Uh, if you're a seven handicap shooting even par, but we got to get you at one of my member guests. <laughs> yeah. well, no. I mean, no. That's the thing, yeah. though. Yeah. I shot that my second best score ever is like, Three or four over. Like I was never. Yeah. It was just that day. It was just it, literally oh, everything was going. In, you know what I mean. And that's so. the thing, man. With golf, some days you got it. Some days you hit it bad. The putts fall. Some days the putts don't fall, and you're hitting it great. What are you gonna do? Exactly. Um, and exactly. that's why it's a lot like life. You just well, got to keep one. One more analogy. Yeah. Yes, you got. You have to keep. You have to keep going. You can't look. I was gonna. You made me think of it. You're looking too far in the distance. You're screwed. Like you. You know how you stand on a tee box sometimes. If you don't see the tee markers uh, or the distance, right, they don't have something up there. You'll look out on that par four, and it looks like it looks like it's five hundred and seventy-five yards away. When in reality, maybe it's only four hundred, right? But it just looks. It's one of those holes that just looks so looks far. long. Yep. And if you are focused on that, and then you get in your head, there's like, there's no way I can make this in three. You know, much less four par. Uh, you know, I'll be lucky to get out of here with a five. Like that is, that's so far away. But it, instead, if you just focus on this little box you're standing in, the batter's box, you know, and you hit that ball and then you walk down there all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, maybe I can get there in two. It's not too bad, you know. And then, and then you just focus on that swing again. And then you, you know, you hit the stick or something and you're like, wow, because it's just, you're taking it one thing at a time. But if you're trying to eat the whole hole in one yeah. bite, like you're, you're done. So uh, I'll tell you, growing up, my, my dad and I played tons of golf together and still do, but, you know, 10, 11 years old, I'd have my dad two down with four to play and I'm just like, that's over. I'm thanking my sponsors, you know, I'm thanking the, the, <laughs> the people, I'm giving high fives to people and, and, you know, the air fives and all that jazz and, and I'd li I literally lost so many times. I could not beat them, but I was two up with four to play and my dad, that's my dad, he said, you're going to learn. He said, you got to be humble and it's not over till it's over. So, uh, and that's a lesson I learned early, early on, um, when I was thinking my, my sponsors that weren't paying me. Um, so that's nice. Man. That's a good lesson to learn, bud. Well, listen, Nate, man, it was awesome having you on here. We got one more segment here. Our last segment of the show called the tap in segment. Jonathan's going to ask you a few questions that demand your response. And this is. Presented by Betnardi Golf. Check them out online at betnardi.com. Mm, great putters. Phenomenal. Great putters. All right, Nate. Other than the University of Texas, because I know you're going to say that, favorite college football stadium that you've played in? Ooh. Uh, well, the one that pops up, I'm, the, I might be the wrong answer, but uh, the one that pops up in my head right now is uh, Ole Miss going on the road. And, and it's a good memory because we blew them out. <laughs> but – you know, you're up in that you're in that stadium, and and everybody's dressed to the nines, and it's you know, the women it's, are beautiful. It's, it's, it's frat mania. We took the bus through the Grove. You know what I mean? Heading up there, yeah. I want to go back and go to a game as a fan, but I, I'll say Ole Miss. All right, 
Music or no music while on the course? No music for me. Dude, I like to be out there really? with nature. Yeah. When same with if I'm going for a run. I've been I've been doing like the ultra running stuff recently. I got a I got a hundred miler coming up in a couple months actually. And people are like, What do you listen to when you go on these long runs? I'm like, nothing. Nature. I let my I let my inner monologue kind of roll and maybe wow. I'll come up with some good for you ideas on what's next. Yeah, now, man. I like to I like to just be there. Now I'm sure you've played a lot of beautiful golf courses, but what is the one golf course that you dream about playing? That I dream about playing? I mean, probably St. Andrews. I, I've I've been I've been I've been able to play uh, some cool ones. I got to play uh, Hazeltine. I got to play Pebble, uh, Spyglass. You know, TPC Sawgrass. I've got to play some cool ones. But St. Andrews is good. Uh, yeah, St. Andrews or 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 uh, Augusta National probably be the two, two hardest ones to get on. But uh, <laughs> you know, well, you can get on St. Andrews. You just got to wait a couple years. But you can pay fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah, or yeah, something. Costs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And the last question, what are you chasing? Hmm. Not birdies. <laughs> <laughs> they come to me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> uh, man, I'm chasing a lot, but uh, and it always changes. Like the goalposts always change, but um, I, 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 I love proving other people or myself wrong. You know what I mean? So chasing challenges. Um, yeah that things that I'm just not quite sure I can do. Like I love, I love, I love that chase. Um, because sometimes you can't do them and that's okay too, but it's just the pursuit is what is where I feel okay. the most yep. gratitude and appreciation. And like, I feel the most happy when I'm, when I'm chasing. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that's that phone ringing. My mom, like my mom knows I'm on this podcast. Like, but I, I didn't think you had a phone in the office. Like I didn't that. think you had a house phone or a office phone from 1986 either, but you yeah, do either. But like, <laughs> Shouldn't that shit vibrate? Especially for you. That's funny. Dude, man, it was awesome, man. We got to link up at some point in time, man. Yeah, uh, for sure. You know, I like what you you're doing. I, I uh, give you a lot of props, man. It's a cool story from you. Well, uh, one of my favorite parts of the whole episode is whenever he said that one of his best friends is Dana Holgerson. I know. But, you know, it was kind of weird because that part dragged on at the end of the interview. And, um, it, yeah, I, I didn't really put that in the show, to be honest with you. Right. But funny well, story, guys. Yeah. Nate Boyer is good friends with Dana Holgerson. Dana Holgerson was the coach of West Virginia. Peppy got a kick out of it because I'm sitting in the old office there recording. I mean, you got to tell everybody my business, bud. Like, <laughs> I mean, come on. Any hooser. <laughs> um, thank you to Nate Boyer. It was dynamite again. Like we awesome. said in the intro, it's it's almost like you feel like you don't do it. Like compared to what he's done in his life, you feel kind of like, what am I doing? Yeah, no, it's incredible. It's an incredible story. Like I said in the beginning, uh, so happy to have you on the show, Nate. Thanks for jumping on here with us, and we wish you all the best in the future. Actually, we can't wait to see you on the golf course because I think we got to try to get a little something going on with. MVP and 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 the perfect place to do that, really, in my opinion, would be at Nemecolin Resort in Farmington, Pennsylvania. Thirty-six holes of championship golf, luxury accommodations, fine dining, pool, whatever you want to do, guys. Check out Nemecolin at nemecolin.com. Book your summer travel. Book your fall stay. Uh, it's a great spot to host families, friends bachelor parties bachelorette parties whatever you want to do buddy even a golf trip if you're really cozying up to south of pittsburgh come on let's go it's a great spot real life magic and we are getting ready for our member guests there in two weeks my man and i believe you're playing with josh miranda oh and i'm playing with ray fulcher and then we got uh, matt alderman coming in and James McNair, and they're going to play a little music, have the member guests, play golf, rock out at Nemecolon. So I'm sure next year there's probably going to be an MVP event at Nemecolon, and maybe old Mark Wahlberg is going to make an appearance. Who knows? I had no... Uh, thanks. Uh, so basically you just told me I got another member guest to prepare for, which is mm -hmm. awesome. I'll tell you what, though. This 12 days off that I've had, well, total 12 days, 13 days itchy, off, itchy. not touching the club... Oh, yeah. No, I'm doing mirror swings. I'm doing hip rotations. I'm doing all that weird stuff with no clubs. 
but it's so nice not to have to like go golf. I mean, 16 times in a month, dude. Come on, give me a break. Uh, what? So this what? Is, what are you doing in Colorado? But hanging, got the kids out here right now, uh, hiking. Uh, there's a really, really pretty gnarly zipline course through the canyons. I'm really scared of heights. Well, so you better be know. careful. There's there was stuff on Good Morning America just on Monday about how a lot of people are getting hurt and falling off of them. So yeah, so maybe I want to. I might not do that, but yeah, just chilling, man, enjoying the holiday, and uh, yeah, it's great. It's great. No golf, but I do want to tell you, man. It's it's been nice getting to see you a little bit. I know it's been a while, so I look forward to pegging it up with you in the future, and you know, keeping this thing rolling. We got. A new drop coming out here in two weeks. We won't elaborate as to who, uh, but it should be a good interview nonetheless, people. So we always appreciate you guys. Someone we just recently ran around with, so uh, it'll be a good time. And again, as Ryan said, thank you. And again, guys, it's not hard. Like, love, listen. It's not hard. Let's let's make this world a little bit better for everyone. Yeah, and, and that's great, bud. Tune in, yeah. Tune into the boys. There it is. I didn't know where you were going with that. I like it though. Make the world better. Listen to us two talk. Yuck it up. We hope you enjoyed it. And thank you, Evo and Ali over there at Simpler Media for putting this thing together. Jacqueline and Rachel for all your social media help. You girls kick butt, kick ass, whatever. We appreciate y'all, and we will check y'all in two. <laughs>